hello lovelies this is your aqa physics paper 2 separate science higher revision video what i've done in this video and in the workbook that goes with it is i've taken all of the topics that are the major focus of the exams the practical the required practicals are going to be exams stuff that is not listed and i put it rearranged it all into this video and the workbook that goes with it this video does not include things that the exam board has told us are not going to be on the exam so this is for AQA physics paper 2 separate science higher if you are not doing that exact exam then go look in the description down below and you'll find the links to the other versions of it combined science the foundation whatever if you are watching this just before your exams and this is probably the last exam you're going to be doing so good luck enjoy the rest of the summer enjoy the rest of the week um if you're watching this a couple of months for your exams then you and me we are going to get through this together. scalar quantity is going to be just a number, a vector quantity is going to be a number and a direction. For example, distance is scalar, but displacement is vector because it's distance in a direction. Mass is scalar, but weight, which is your mass upon the earth, is vector. Speed is scalar, but velocity, which is speed in a certain direction, is vector. Acceleration and force are both vector, and momentum is also vector. If we're looking for the resultant force, we need to find the difference between them. For example, here we have 10 plus 10 newtons minus 5 newtons is going to give us plus 5 newtons which is going to be 5 newtons in that direction. For the second one we have plus 2 newtons minus plus 2 newtons giving us 0 newtons as overall resultant force so there is going to be no movement. Your weight is not the same as your mass because your weight is equal to your mass times gravity. Your weight is measured in newtons, your mass is measured in kilograms and gravity is measured in newtons per kilogram. So your mass will never change, but your weight will change depending on the planet or depending on gravity. Which is why when they went to the moon, they were basically weightless so they could jump around. Another W here, were equals force times distance. Work is measured in joules, force is measured in newtons, and distance is measured in meters. So that one joule is equal to one newton meter. When you exert a force on an object, it is going to be squashed or stretched or deformed in some way. Here I've done an experiment for you. This is commonly known as Hooke's law. What I've done is taken a spring. This is the bottom of the spring, kept marked in every single photo, and I've added weights onto the bottom of it. You can see that the length of the spring is getting longer the more weights are added onto the bottom of it. We can plot what happens in Hooke's law because it is our direct line until we get to a certain point and this point is the limits of proportionality. Before that it is going to stretch so the more force we add on as we increase force the extension is going to be increased after we get to the limit of proportionality no matter how much force you add on it is not going to stretch anymore is potentially going to snap. Force equals the spring constant times extension. Force is measured in newtons, extension is measured in meters, and the spring constant is measured in newtons per meter. Kinetic energy is equal to half times mass times velocity squared. Kinetic energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, velocity is measured in meters per second and with this the squared is just around the meters per second so you have to do that bit first. A fluid can either be a liquid or a gas. 
liquids are incompressible, the examples like that word, or as gases are compressible. Pressure equals force over area. The units for pressure are pascals. For force, it is newtons, and for area, it is meters squared. I have seen exam questions which use newtons per meter squared for pressure. If they do that in the exam question, give your answer in the same format. I've also seen exam questions where they've done newtons per centimeter squared. So if the question is in that format, give your answer in that format. This is one that you have to pay attention to because they could be sneaky here. Pressure with a P equals height times density, which is a lowercase rho, times gravitational field strength. Pressure is measured in pascals. Height is measured in meters. Density is measured in kilograms per meters cubed. And gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Distance is equals speed times time. Distance is measured in meters. Speed or velocity is measured in meters per second. Time is measured in seconds. Distance time graphs tell us lots of information. If we have a slope that is increasing, we are moving. And the deeper the slope, the faster we're moving. If it is a flat line, it is not moving. We can see that as time is increasing, our distance is not increasing. So in a distance time graph, the flat bit is not moving. We can calculate speed as the gradient. Gradient is up over across, which is going to be distance over time. Velocity time graphs look very, very similar to distance time graphs, but are difference. For example, at our flat speed here, it is now moving, but it is going at a steady speed. We can see that when they are increasing, they are accelerating. So we now know that acceleration is equal to the gradient. That's up over across or velocity over time. If we want to work out the distance traveled, that's the area under the graph. For this section here, it is a triangle. So to work that out, it's going to be half times base times height. For this section here, that is a rectangle, so that is going to be base times height. This section in the middle here is a bit more complicated because we have a triangle, a rectangle, and a triangle. So that is base times height plus half times base times height. And the height is the height of the triangle there. Acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over time. We can work out the change in velocity by taking the final velocity and minusing the initial velocity and the time taken by taking the final time and minusing the initial time. Acceleration is in meters per second squared, velocity is in meters per second and time is in seconds. Final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared is equal to 2 times acceleration times distance. Velocity final and initial is measured in meters per second, acceleration is in meters per second squared, and distance is in meters. When you are falling, when something is falling, terminal velocity is going to be reached when all forces are balanced. A velocity time graph for this would be very fast acceleration as the object initially started to fall. As the object started to balance out, that would slow, and when they reach terminal velocity, there would be no further increase in speed. When you are free falling under gravity, your speed is going to be um, 9 0.8 meters per second, which is the same as the value of gravity, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Momentum is mass times velocity. Mass is measured in kilograms, velocity is measured in meters per second, and then momentum is measured in kilogram with a space meters per second. I know there's a temptation to put another line in there, but that would be wrong. The law of conservation of momentum says that momentum is always conserved, which in calculations means your momentum before is going to equal your momentum afterwards. So if you have two objects colliding, that momentum together before is equal to the collided combined object afterwards. A transverse wave goes up and down. From one point to another point, and this doesn't matter whether it's from the top to the bottom, from the middle to the middle, we have the wavelength. The amplitude is measured from the middle 
to the top or from the middle to the bottom. The direction of movement for this is up and down. This could also be the direction of oscillation. And the direction of energy transfer is sideways. Here we have our longitudinal wave where we have areas of compression and areas of refraction. We can measure the wavelength in this from one point to another point. The direction of movement is side to side and so is the direction of energy. Frequency is the number of waves per second. So if we look at this block here as a second in time, something that will have a low frequency, we are not going to see many peaks in one second. But something that had a high frequency, we would see lots of peaks or lots of waves within one second. You'll notice that for the high frequency one, it has a low wavelength, whereas for the low frequency one, it has a high or a long wavelength. If we want to measure the time period for something, that is one over the frequency. Time is measured in seconds and frequency is measured in hertz. There is a capital H and a lowercase z. Do not write lowercase both letters or uppercase both letters because they are wrong. If we want to measure the speed of a wave, we can use a ripple tank. Um, this here will go in and out of the water, creating waves. From this, we can measure wavelength and also looking at how many waves pass a certain point in a second frequency. Then we can use our equation um, to work out the speed of the wave. The equals f times lambda. To work out the speed of a wave, wave speed, we can take the frequency and times it by the wavelength. Our units for speed are in meters per second. Frequency is in hertz, capital H, lowercase z, and wavelength is in meters. A sound wave is a longitudinal wave. It vibrates the air particles, and your eardrum in here will pick up the vibration of the air particles and turn it into sounds which your brain can interpret. The range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. We can use echo or ultrasound to determine distance and we can do that because speed equals distance over time. So if we know the speed of the wave we can measure the time taken and we can calculate the distance. So um, a vessel exploring the sea can send down um, an ultrasound and measure the time it takes to come back. And the time it takes to come back will be shorter or longer depending on the distance. Now the really, really important thing to um, note here is that it is there and back again. So the time is double um, what it would be because the time it takes to get there and back is twice just the time it takes to get there. So if you have an echo and ultrasound um, calculation you need to find distance, you need to think logically about the time calculation that you're using. Ultrasounds can also be used for medical imaging. Here is my massive bump. Here was my massive baby. And you can see the hard parts, the jaw, the skull, the legs. They are going to reflect the ultrasound much more than the liquid or the soft tissue parts. When an earthquake occurs, we can use the resulting waves to give us information about the structure of the Earth's Earth. P waves are primary waves. They are longitudinal. They can travel through solids and liquids, which means they can travel all the way through the Earth. So if an earthquake happens over here, the P waves are going to go all the way through, including through the solid core. S waves are secondary waves. They are transverse waves and they can only go through solids so they can't go through liquids and because of these two different types of waves and how they're detected on the opposite side of the earth and um, this tells us information about the structure of the earth. Our solar system is a beautiful um, varied and fascinating thing Starting with the Sun all the way over here, we move through Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and our moons. The asteroid belts with some dwarf planets in, I'll come back to those in a second. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and poor old Pluto down here, which isn't a planet anymore. It's just a dwarf planet. To help you remember the order, we have my very easy method, just beads up naming. And then it used to be planets at the end, but Pluto isn't a planet anymore, so it's now my very easy method just speeds up naming if you guys have any other um ways that you remember the order of the planets or anything else pop that in the comments below because i'm sure loads of other people would love to see what you come up with so poor old pluto here it used to be a planet it is now a dwarf planet um, i'll do a separate video on why pluto is now a dwarf planet but our dwarf planets are here 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 and here. I'm not going to try and pronounce some of those names because I'm very, very sure I will get it wrong. And um, we have an asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. 
um, and then another belt of large objects right on the edge. The galaxy that we live in is the Milky Way and here you can see the Milky Way stretching across the sky. We are on the edge of the Milky Way on one of the arms right on the outside. In the middle is a black hole. Here we have the life cycle of a star. It is going to start off as a cloud of dust and gas. And these are going to come together under the force of gravity because everything has gravity, no matter how small it is, um, no matter how large it is, it all has gravity. And then we're going to be a main sequence star. Our sun is actually a rather small star in comparison to most of the other stars in the galaxy, in the universe. Um, lots and lots of them are much, much bigger. Now, depending on the size of the star, they're going to undergo two different things. Our sun being a rather small star, once um, the nuclear fusion that goes on in the centre has run out of fuel it is going to become a red giant and then it is going to cool down um, into a white dwarf or a black dwarf if it is a large star much much more massive than our sun it is going to become a red super giant it's going to undergo supernova and then the dense dense core of that is either going to turn into a black hole or or a neutron star. Now our sun is a second generation star because after this um, red supergiant undergoes supernova, what we are left with is a cloud of dust and gas. And that cloud of dust and gas can get together again to form a new star. And we know this is because the sun has heavy elements. Things like iron are present in the center of the star. Which means, since we were created from this cloud of dust and gas, which also formed the Earth, that you literally used to be a star. You are a star. You are made of stardust. You are a star. You can tell people that. In the centre of a star, we have loads of hydrogen and helium. And they're going to be fusing together. This is nuclear fusion. Not fusion that takes place on reactors that we have on Earth, but nuclear fusion. And we can see that massive amounts of energy is released. And this is energy as light and as heat energy. And if we were close enough, we'd be able to get the heat of sound energy as well. When all of the helium um, and hydrogen nuclei in the middle run out, that is when our star's um, life comes to an end. Now our star, our sun, is a main sequence star, so it's going to have heavy elements as well. They are going to be undergoing the same process but the majority of um, elements inside a star inside the majority of stars in the universe are going to be hydrogen and helium. An artificial satellite is going to be something that we've put up into space to orbit the earth whereas a natural satellite is going to be something like the moon which naturally orbits the earth. A satellite is just anything that orbits the earth. They maintain their orbit around the Earth due to gravity. There is a key distinction between the terms speed and velocity. Speed is how fast you are going. Velocity is how fast you are going in a certain direction. So speed is going to be a scalar quantity and velocity is going to be a vector quantity. If something is going in a circle, for example, orbiting the planets, it can be going at a constant speed but it is not going in the same direction. If it is going in the same direction, it would always be going like that, in straight lines. So it is constantly changing direction, which is why you can have a change in velocity while going at the same speed. When we are looking at stars, we can see light coming from them, and the wavelength of light can tell us things about them. If the wavelength has increased, the frequency has decreased, it means the wave is being stretched out. It's moving away from us. When the wavelength is increased, the light that's coming from these stars is going to look red. We can say this is red shifted. Sometimes the light coming from these stars might look a bit blue. When stars look a bit blue, it's because the wave is being squashed. It has a decreased wavelength and increased frequency. That means that the star is coming towards us. The majority of stars in the galaxy are moving away from us. You're going to get uh, maybe a dual system where one is moving away from us, one is moving towards us. So one might show red shift and one might show blue shift shift. But the majority are moving away from us. And because they're moving away from us, we can make the reverse assumption that at one point they were closer to us, really close to us. Or that at one point they were in the same place as us. And this is how red shift gives evidence for the Big Bang.
when a wave is reflected, it is going to come in, meet the boundary, and then be reflected off. Our angle of incidence is always going to be equal to our angle of reflection. So we can always say that I equals R. Your normal line is in the middle here. It is a dashed line, and it is drawn at 90 degrees to the mirror or the surface that the wave is being reflected off. If we have a sound wave instead of a light wave that is being reflected, we are going to get an echo. My ray box with my perspex blocks, I've drawn around three positions with the perspex block and now I'm going to draw the ray diagram. So now we've finished with the ray box and what I've done is I've drawn, you so I've had my ruler drawn nice straight lines where the light goes in and light goes out. I'm just going to put my ruler there. And the first thing I want you to notice is that this is where the light went in, this is where the light came out, the perspex block, up my ruler there, and you'll notice that the light lines don't line up. The ray of light has changed place as it has gone into and out of the box, and this is refraction. So now we're going to draw, um, I'll show you how to draw ray diagrams for these. I will do them for perspex, and then I did a glass block as well. Same thing we can see with the glass block, that the ray going in does not match the ray going out there in different locations. Um, I'll show you how to draw the ray diagrams and then we will look at the result. So I'm going to do it for this block in the middle here. I've drawn around the block and it's my ray going in and my ray going out. And the first thing I'm going to do is join up the two rays of light. So we can now see the path that the light took as it went in. What I need to do now is to draw on my normal. So with my um, protractor, I'm going to line my protractor up there. I'm going to put a point at 90 degrees. Then I'm going to join that up. And I'm going to join it up with a dashed line. This is my normal. I'm going to do the same for the ray coming out. So I'm going to put the point, uh, the middle of the protractor where the ray came out of the box. Put a little dash at 90 degrees. Use my ruler to join that up there and there. I'm going to do that with a dash line. So that's my second normal. Now we need to measure our angles of incidence and our angles of refraction. This one here is our angle of incidence. There is our angle of refraction. We always measure it against the normal. Same on the other side. There is our angle of refraction. There is our angle of incidence. Now I can use my protractor to measure these values. Just going to make the lines a bit longer. So putting the middle of my protractor on the middle of it there, lining that up, and that is going through 21 degrees. Doing the same on the other side, 13 degrees there, 13 degrees there, and that one is 30 degrees. I'll keep going with the rest of these and then I'll show you the results. results from my experiment and you can see they are not perfect. Here we have angle of incidence 30 with 13, 19 and 20 as the angle of refraction. This is okay, it was a real experiment, real life is not perfect. We'll be able to see the relationship better when we plot it on a graph. Now for glass, this is quite nice. We've got them all clustered around a central area, so I can draw my line a best fit like that. Whereas Perspex, there does seem to be a couple of odd results. So I'm gonna circle those, these are my normal results, and I'm gonna ignore them when I draw my line of best fit. So we can see for both sets of results, the angle of refraction, the angle of incidence for Perspex and glass, we do have a nice relationship. A straight line relationship, these lines look to be parallel to each other but they are not the same. That's because when we are going from air into perspex or air into glass there's going to be a different change in refractive index. When we're moving from medium one into medium two and this can be air into perspex, air into glass, water into glass, water into perspex, basically any media. 
there's going to be a change in the refractive index and we can work out critical angle of the refractive index we can work out the angle of incidence the angle of refraction this is called Snell's law and that's going to be the angle of incidence sine of the angle of incidence divided by sine of the angle of refraction is equal to refractive index or the thing that it's moving into divided by the refractive index the thing that it's moving from and it's important to note that not the critical angle the angle of refraction is 90 degrees Here we have a Newton's cradle, which really elegantly demonstrates a number of physics principles. First of all, inertia. An object that is in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. An object at rest will remain in rest unless acted on by an outside force. So those balls in the middle are only going to move if something hits them. And those balls on the outside are only going to stop if something stops them. It demonstrates the conservation of energy, where the balls only slow down as they lose energy to other things. In this case, you can't hear it, but it's losing energy to sound, and it's losing energy to a bit of friction within the air. This will keep going for as long as there is energy within the system. And it also demonstrates Newton's third law, where for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And we can see this as the balls keep hitting each each other. Inertia is where an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by force and an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. You can put this into action if you are um, driving along and you have your seatbelt on, the car brakes. You would not brake as well unless you were acted on by force, that force being your seatbelt. Conservation of energy. An energy is never created or destroyed, it is only turned into something else. Here it has been turned into sound and a little bit of heat. And for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Force equals mass times acceleration. Force is measured in newtons. Mass is measured in kilograms. And acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. Stopping distance for a car is going to be made up of two things, thinking distance and braking distance. And you can see that the faster you're going, the more the stopping distance and the thinking distance increases. This is because for thinking distance, your brain needs to firstly see the image. The signal is getting sent to your brain, needs to be processed and signal needs to get sent all the way down to your foot and the faster you're going the more distance you'll travel in the time that takes things that affect thinking distance are going to be drinking alcohol is negatively going to affect it taking illegal drugs is negatively going to affect it but taking something like caffeine is going to positively affect it tiredness is going to negatively affect it things that are going to affect braking distance are the conditions of the tires so nice new tires are going to stop much quicker than old tires which don't have much grip on the road the condition of the road so a snowy ice Icy road is going to have much longer braking distance than a new road or road that has a lot of um, grit on it is also going to have a long braking distance and the weight of the car. A heavy, heavy car is going to take much longer to stop. There are a large number of features in a car designed to make it safer. First of all, seat belts, uh, baby seats, believe it or not, when I was brought home in the car, I was literally just put in the car. Uh, crumple zones at the front, airbags are a few of the examples. You can easily make an electromagnet at home. All you need is a battery, some wire and an iron nail. Because all an electromagnet is, is an iron core with a wire around it connected up to a current. You can use this to pick up things like um, paper clips or iron filings. When a current is passed through the wire, it creates a magnetic field around the wire. And this in turn strongly magnetises the iron bar thus creating our electromagnet. If you want to change the strength of an electromagnet, you can do two things. You can change the current, or you can change the number of turns or the number of coils um, that the Y times the Y is wrapped around the iron core. For Fleming's left hand rule, we need to make our left hand in this shape here. So finger pointing out, thumb up, finger out. Your first finger is your magnetic field. This thing here is the current, and then your thumb is the movement of the force. And what you need to do when you have an exam question is literally contort your hands until it fits in the right direction. So first is nice and easy. My field is going in that direction. My current is going in that direction. So the movement of the force um, is going upwards. This one here is a bit more complicated because this finger needs to be pointing in that direction. My current needs to be going down, and then my thumb is going into the page. We can change the size of the force by changing the current, by changing the strength of the magnet, 
or by changing the angle between the wire and the magnetic field lines. The greatest force is when the wire is perpendicular with magnetic field lines, and the force is going to be zero if the wire and the field lines are parallel. Magnetic flux density is the amount of magnetic flux in a certain area. And the equation that we use for this is force equals magnetic flux density times current times length. You'll notice really annoyingly that this is an uppercase I and a lowercase L. Our units for this, for force, are newtons. For magnetic flux density, they are tesla. For current, it is amps. And for length, that is meters. While this is called a simple electric motor, there's actually quite a lot of physics going on here. And for this, we really need to use our Fleming's left hand rule. So our magnetic field is going from north to south like this. Our current is moving actually in two different directions. On this side, it's moving in this direction, and on the other side, it's moving in this direction. So what we are going to have is that when the um, wire is moving past the south bit of the magnet, the force is going to be going down, and when it's moving past the north face of the magnet, the force is going to be going up. And because one side is being pushed down, the other side is being pushed up, it is going to turn around. A moving coil loudspeaker works by making a diaphragm attached to a coil vibrate. When we have a current passing through the coil, the force that is generated by the motor effect makes the coil move. Every time the current changes direction, the force reverses direction. So the coil is going to be going back and forwards, making the diaphragm go back and forward, generating sound waves. A moving coil microphone works for the same principle, but in the opposite direction. Sound causes the diaphragm to vibrate, the diaphragm is attached to the coil. The vibration of the diaphragm moves the coil, which is going to cause the coil to move backwards and forwards past the magnet. The generator effect is just an extension of Fleming's left hand rule. When we have a wire and we move it through a magnetic field, we are going to be generating a current. In a transformer, we have a soft iron core. We have a wire which is going to be coiling around, and you notice there are a different number of coils here. We are going to be looking at varying the number of coils so that we vary the um, voltage that goes into and comes out of our transformer. If we have a step up transformer, the secondary voltage is going to be be greater than the primary voltage so the voltage coming out is going to be greater than the voltage going in if we have a step down transformer the secondary voltage is going to be less than the primary voltage so the um, voltage coming out is going to be less than the voltage going in when we are looking at transformers calculations we have voltage in the primary coil divided by voltage in the secondary coil equals the number of turns in the primary coil divided by the number of turns in the secondary coil our units for this are going to be for voltage, that is volts. A number of turns doesn't have a unit because it's just a number. You need to know that voltage in the secondary coil times the current in the secondary coil is equal to voltage in the primary coil times the current in the primary coil. And our units for voltage are volts for current, amps, voltage, volts, current, amps. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.